guys so much for having me. I have written a lot about specialty coffee and covering coffee in LA, and it's really an honor to be included in this as well. All right, so coffee and beer and beer and coffee, they're like the yin and yang of our generation, right? They bookend the day for so many people. <laughs> uppers and downers and mornings and nights. And yet, while they're so different, both of them are having these unprecedented craft renaissances, right? There's artisanal renaissances, even though you have one man-made product and one artisanal product. And I think there's so many things that these two industries can learn from one another. And I've written a lot about what craft beer can learn from coffee in my work. And I think what we can learn is ingredients and sourcing, because you guys all have so much connection to your farmers and to your ingredients just by the very nature of your product. But for most part, craft beer is still really an industrial product, right? We still use the same exact malts and the same exact hops as the big guys. And so what you're starting to see more and more are breweries that are taking advantage of the farmers and of these sing so single hop varietals. Hops are the bitterness product, the bittering agent in craft beer. And so what you see here is a single hop IPA series from McKellar. They're a Danish brewery, really progressive. And so hops are grown at, this, at different latitudes uh, across the world, just like coffee is grown at different latitudes. And so you have like Centennial and Amarillo, which are grown in the Pacific Northwest. You have Sriracha Ace, which is grown in New Zealand. But so often these are like thrown together in a big pot and kind of in one, in one thing. And so what breweries are doing are isolating these and trying to isolate this terroir, this flavor, like what does a New Zealand hop taste like? What does a, northern, a Northwest hop taste like? And isolating these so that consumers can try the difference between them and see what that's like. Second ingredient we can do a lot with is the malts and the grains. And this is a lot of crossover with specialty coffee as well. And so this is a photo my friend took while she was uh, reporting in the Central Coast. This is a winemaker who decided to take scrap half of his land and turn it into a malt farm, a barley farm. And he's now he's malting and micro-malting uh, specialty grains and heirloom grains, not just for specialty bakers, artisanal bakers, but also for craft brewers as well. And uh, I think in the roasting process as well is so similar. And I know a lot of you know Chris Schooley in Colorado, and he's part of my connection to this. I've written some stories about him as well, and I realized, oh my gosh, these roasting processes are so similar. You're still trying to get the caramelization out of, the, out of these grains, it, just like you are out of the beans as well. And so I think you'll see a lot more of this connection with the farmers and connection with, uh, with roasters as well. Uh, there was just an heirloom grain dinner not too long ago here at, um, I forget where they were hosting it, but it was a chef, and Highland Park Brewery made some heirloom grain beer, beers uh, from the Tehachapi grain farm. So there are these increasing connections. We're trying to return craft beer to a truly regional specialty product, which is what it used to be in the old days, back in Belgium, when brewers were making them on their farms and stuff. And it's become this huge commodified thing. Uh, beyond knowing the growers, there are some breweries that are taking it upon themselves to own the whole farm. So there's Rogue up in Eastern Oregon. You can go to a farm and sit on a patio like you would at a vineyard and look out over the hop farms and look out over the barley farms and drink a beer that could have only been made on that earth, on that land. And you're really tasting the terroir of Eastern Oregon, whatever that manages to taste like. Stone Brewing does the same thing. They have a hop farm. Sierra Nevada has an estate ale that they make exclusively with hops grown on the owner's farm up in uh, Chico. And so I think you'll start to see a lot more of this, and especially more as specialty coffee uh, professionals start coming into the craft beer world. I know you guys drink craft beer anyway, so coming out with us. <laughs> There'll be a lot more of this in the future. So then that leads me to think, well, what can specialty coffee learn from beer? How can we repay you for all of this help in, in us progressing? You know, we convinced people to drink craft beer, and, and now we're getting more and more into our ingredients, which is what you guys have done all along. So what can specialty coffee learn from beer? I sling beer every day, just like you guys sling coffee every day. You know, we're both at the front lines of our industries, at the front lines of the educational level. And this is a photo out front of the beer bar that I work at. It's in downtown Long Beach. It's Beachwood Barbecue. They're like one of the best beer bars in the country. See, all right. Not because it's not the best because I work there, but uh, according to the Brewers Association, um, but they do have a lot of hype around them because the beers are that good. These people. This was taken two weeks ago. These people are waiting in line to spend twenty dollars on one twenty-two ounce bottle of beer. A lot of them bought the maximum, which is six, so it's $130 per transaction. How the hell do we get people to pay that much money for beer and, what? I was just going to, let me finish my sentence. That, and still you guys get scoffed at, oh, five bucks for this? What is this? So how did we create this valuation? How did we like empower our customers to understand that this is a craft product, this is worth this kind of money. These are, it's a bourbon barrel aged beer, so you got to pay for the barrels and stuff. That's part of the reason why it is a little bit more expensive. 
And I think a lot, it wasn't this way always. I mean, craft beer has only come about, especially in Los Angeles, in the last five or six years. So six years ago, I actually helped open a bar that's two doors down from this in the bottom of that brick building right there. It's called Congregation Ale House. And when that place opened, it was the first place in Long Beach that had ever served craft beer. And it's in the middle of this, like, if you go a block over, it's all it's, it's clubs and stuff. So you're in this, like, downtown area where, yeah, where people are in, they're ordering Jack and Cokes and stuff. They don't know what craft beer is. And we had 40 taps of beers that nobody had ever heard of. We're serving them in different size glassware, and nobody knew what to, to do with it. And people were walking in those first few weeks that I was working there, and they would come up and very confidently order a pitcher of Blue Moon. They would go, yo, can I get a pitcher of Blue Moon? They wouldn't even ask for it. They knew we had it, because why wouldn't we? We were in this area. You know, They were on their bar crawl. Of course we had a pitcher of Blue Moon. And I was thinking, okay, I need to learn to talk to these people about craft beer when their base level knowledge of beer is Blue Moon. So how can I, which isn't bad, it's a gateway beer, right? It's like, you, you, they, need the, they need the way in. So I knew I couldn't just snub them and say, nope, we don't have that, and send them back to this board that's probably very daunting and overwhelming for them. So I had to figure out a way to sell them on what we had. I had to figure out a way to give them some knowledge, some little nugget, and educate them at that point of sale, in that moment. Even, you know, hopefully they don't even know that they're getting that knowledge. Hopefully they walk away with some, knowing something that they didn't even know that I, like, planted in their head. So my pitch was always, oh, well, I have a Belgian wit on draft. It's actually, it's made in, Be in Brussels. It's brewed in Belgium. It's way better. It's what Blue Moon wishes it was. And that was always my, like, sell on it, was like, this is not even, this is not even comparable to Blue Moon, but it's better. It's like what Blue Moon want, wanted to be and kind of failed at. So drink this better one. And I would sell these people, instead of a pitcher of Blue Moon, I would sell them on six 12-ounce glasses in tulip glasses of, of Bronze to Brussels, which is a Belgian wit. And so they walked away with a little bit more of an understanding of what's in their cup. And so I wanted to see if this was happening in specialty coffee, if I could go into a coffee shop and get these little nuggets of knowledge. And so I did a little uh, secret shopping, I guess, in the, last few, in the last few months as preparing for this talk. And I really wanted to put the bed, the, like, the whole trope that they're, all baristas are snobby and they don't want to help you understand coffee and all that. And I found about half and half, okay? So there were some when I would go in and I would play dumb. And to be honest, I am dumb because I drink specialty coffee every day and I really don't, I pay four bucks for it because it tastes so good, but I don't know what I'm drinking. And I have no idea how to tell you guys what I like in coffee. I could not, before this, before researching for this, I could not tell you how to find a coffee for me that I like. And so I would say, I just want a hot coffee and I don't know what else. And so often I would have menus like this thrown in front of me without comment. They would be, well, this is what we have. And it would be pushed in front of me. Now, and one of these is a photo that I took as the guy pushed it and then walked away from me. And I was like, okay, what are these words? What's a tactic and go, I don't know how to pronounce it. I'm so sorry, I'm butchering. I don't know what a culpin is. What does altitude have anything to do with the flavor? I have no clue. What process, what are washing? Does that matter in flavor? Is that just for fanciness? I have no idea. And then I'm looking at these adjectives. Okay, maybe the adjectives will help me figure out what I want. What kind of flavors do I want? Uh, what's a walnut body? Is that a, f a color or a flavor of walnut? And what the hell is a subtle pineapple acidity? If it's subtle, why are you mentioning it first? Why is that the main flavor? I, and I know that the adjective thing, I usually see like the trifecta of adjectives. And so often I'm staring at those three adjectives and I'm like, I'm trying to figure out what the flavor is in the middle of those three adjectives. And I can't because the three adjectives are like all over the board and I can't visualize what the middle of that is. And over here, there's, it says milk chocolate. And I've realized because I, I, like most of your customers, am coming from a Starbucks experience, right? That's my experience with coffee. And so to me, milk chocolate, I think of a mocha. And I'm like, well, I don't like mochas, so I don't like that. And I've said before, oh, I, well, I don't like milk chocolate flavors. But the milk chocolate that you guys have on your flavor wheel is totally different than the milk chocolate that people are thinking of when these kinds of menus are pushed in front of them. And so I just saw a lot of missed opportunities when someone comes in and just goes, I want a coffee. There's this missed opportunity that I saw to have, start a conversation, to engage with me a little bit more, even at that point, so even if there's a line out the door, in that transaction, in those few minutes you have with someone. And the one question I always wanted to be asked that I hoped so badly someone would ask me, and nobody really did, was this one. So it's, what do you usually drink? This is, a, this is a question that I ask every single day at the bar, right? If somebody, even if somebody knows about beer and they come up and they go, what should I drink next? I'm like, well, what did you drink before? What do you usually drink? What are you in the mood for? And I don't find that those conversations are really happening at the coffee shop as much. You know, and if somebody had asked me, what do you usually drink? I would have said Starbucks Veranda Blend, which is 
I'm totally a plebe, right? Like the, but that, and I probably would feel too embarrassed to say that given some of the, some of the environments that I've walked into. But if I did tell you Starbucks ran a blend, you know a couple of things about me, right? You know that I'm light, okay, I'm interested in lighter roast. I'm interested in lighter bodied, lighter flavors maybe. I'm not, I don't want an Italian or an espresso roast or anything too crazy. But once you have that, once you ask someone that and you open the doors to conversation, how do, you, how do you start that? How do you continue that conversation? How do you make what you're selling and all your knowledge, how do you make it approachable to people? And so I think you can do what we do in beer, which is, because, because your lexicon is not in my, whoops, sorry, your lexicon is not my lexicon yet. I don't know a lot of these terms that you guys know and you use so fluidly among each other. So I think you guys can do what beer does, which is use more simplistic terms and use these simple dichotomies, these ways that consumers can really easily understand and visualize a, such a complex product. And I admit, you're specialty coffee is so much more complex than craft beer in a lot of ways because there's so many different nuances. You can't just say origin is all about origin. It's not because things from, different, from the same origin taste wildly different. But if there are these simple terms that you can use, this is our flavor wheel. This is the beer flavor wheel. It looks similar. It looks familiar, right? But we don't use all of these terms. There's some like vegetal. I'm not going to tell someone that a beer tastes vegetal. But we do say tart, you know, I wouldn't say gassy, that's weird too. But there are some, you know, but citrus, citrus, cheesy, that's another one. That Sour, these are good. Some are good, some are not good. So finding the ones that are relatable, the ones that are approachable, the ones that do work for specialty coffee within your lexicon, I think would be a really great place to start. And you can make specialty coffee fun. You know, craft beer is fun. That's why people come out. And yeah, you're getting drunk. Okay, so that's part of the fun. But... <laughs> I'm really stoked to get my caffeine for the day, right? I'm jazzed. That's fun for me. So why not make that fun as well? And why not have fun with the descriptions and with the adjectives too? So these are examples of some craft beer lists that I have seen that come out. So you'll notice that like when we put our when we put the information about a beer on a list, we put the ABV tells you how, you know, messed up you're going to get on it. The IBUs, that's the bitterness, international bitterness units. So that tells you how bitter it, the beer is. We don't put these crazy things on there like the Play-Doh or the original gravity. I mean, these are measurements that brewers use that are very, very important for when you're brewing beer, but they don't really matter much to consumers. You know, how many consumers can look at an original gravity and know, oh, that's a beer I'm interested in. I like those OGs. Um, but here we, and I loved this one because it creates these dichotomies, this pale to dark the malty to hoppy. And maybe those are words that consumers don't know, but I find that even when somebody orders a beer and when I'm handing it back to them, in that simple transaction, that's like the most basic thing. They don't have to ask me, they don't have to ask me, what does this beer taste like? When they order something, I'll confirm their order and say, oh, that IPA, it's so bitter, it's really hoppy, you like hoppy beers, you'll love this one. And right there, they've learned that hoppy means bitter. So if they see either one of those words, they know that they're kind of interchangeable. And the same thing goes for malty, because that's a, be a lot of Belgian beers are malty, but people see malty and they think like, oh, like malted milk or Whoppers, like nobody, you know, they don't get it. But I'll repeat it back to them. I'll say, oh, are you, if you're into malty beers, I have this really sweet beer on draft. There, they figured out that malty means sweet. And the same goes for dry. Like I've sold dry, there's a lot of dry ciders. People are like, well, I'll, I guess I'll take that dry cider. What is that? Oh, that's a dry cider. It's a lot, it's not as sweet as a sweet cider. So they know that dry doesn't mean wet, not wet, right? Dry means not sweet. So these are terms that we can very casually and without them even feeling like we're giving them a lecture or we're talking down to them. They don't have to come in on a Saturday for a class or a cupping session or anything. And we can still educate them on these things. And this one on the left, this is a, a bar or a brewery in Huntington Beach near my house. Has anybody ever seen the meme that this is from? So pitted, brah, whoppa. Anybody? Okay, a couple. Yeah. The waves are so sick, you get barreled, man. Okay. So I thought this was so fun. I was like, this is the most fun beer name I think I've ever seen. It's called So Pitted. And they're in Huntington, which makes it better. But look, it says featuring experimental hops, which just sounds snobby. It sounds pretentious. Oh, we only use experimental hops here. Um, HBC 342. So that's how they name hops when they're like, Mer they're tweaking them. It's kind of, hops are really, they're related to marijuana. So there's a lot of, they're in the same family. They grow on vines and stuff. So there's a lot of blending now that craft beer is a thing. People like hoppy beers. The people, there are botanists out there that are sitting there blending all these hops. But what the hell is HBC 342? I have no idea. 
the menu could have easily just said, we use this experimental hop and just left it there and confused so many people. But it was really cool that they made it fun and they put, okay, earthy pine, melon, tropical fruit. And if you've heard those adjectives used before to describe IPAs, oh, this is a citra IPA. It's so full of tropical fruit and melon and citrus flavors. Or there's other IPAs that are really piney. So when I see this, I go, oh, that's a pine and melon flavor? Like that must be a blend of of these two different kinds of hops. And then it says, makes your mouth go whoop So you kind of get an idea, oh my God, this is a super hoppy beer. It's gonna like, it's a palate wrecker, right? It's gonna attack your mouth. That's another fun thing we use, palate wrecker. Like, I don't know if there's an equivalent in coffee for that, but. Um, and then the beer below it, I'm sorry I got cut off, but it says sweet like honey and easy drinking. You know, why couldn't that be used to describe a coffee? I'm sure there's coffees out there that are sweet like honey and easy drinking on the, you know, and then they wouldn't need to put sugar in it or they wouldn't ask for a white mocha maybe. Um, so I think that those are some things in the terminology and in the lexicon that, uh, that can be used for, that can be taken from craft beer and very easily transferred into the coffee world. And the second thing I think that coffee can learn from craft beer is variety. Because even though we have spent so much of our careers as, as craft beer drinkers trying to get away from what those fizzy yellow lagers, right? This is stone. They go, fizzy yellow beers for wussies. This is like their slogan. And so, and that's what it was in the 90s when craft beer started. They wanted to give like a huge middle finger to big beer. And, that, and big beer was fizzy yellow beer. And I mean, has everyone ever had Arrogant Bastard? That's like a 9% big, boozy, imperial IPA. It's, it's, yeah, it's crazy. It'll mess you up too. Um, but how, I mean, that's like the biggest middle finger beer to big beer. But now you see that we're going backwards and we're making fizzy yellow beers. We're making light beers. I don't know if you've seen session beers around or yard beers or lawnmower beers, they're sometimes calling them. They're beers you can just, they're under 5% and you can drink a ton of them in one sitting. And which is, which is basically what Bud Light is good for. But we make it with flavor, and we make it with the same dedication to craft and to artisanal practices that we make the bigger beers. They don't have to be big in flavor. And it's actually really hard to make a light beer that tastes good because there's nothing to hide behind. You can hide behind your alcohol, just like you can hide behind your dark roast, right? You cannot have a good quality bean and hide and roast it to hell until you can't taste it. You can take a beer that's bad and up the alcohol content, and you'll never taste how bad it is. <laughs> So now you start seeing, I mean, this is a trend now. There are session pilsners. I mean, who would have thought that we would have gone all the way backwards into this? And so in, in craft beer, you do see so much variety that when you go into beer bars, this is the kind of thing you get. You can have anything. Like, this is, this is that imperial stout that people were waiting in line for. There's a, I, there are um, saisons on here. There's a coffee stout. This guy uses Portola as well in his coffee beers for the coffee reference. Um, there's a sour beer. There's a smoked beer on there. There's all these different varieties. You can, and it's so much easier to help people find what they want when you have a lot of variety to offer them. You would never go into a craft beer bar and see only IPAs. And to be honest, that's essentially what a specialty coffee shop with only light grassy roasts are. I mean, you have 52% of your consumers that still crave a dark roast. That's, I didn't make that up. That's some marketing statistics that I found. So you're alienating half of potentially new specialty coffee fans by not offering some darker roast. Doesn't need to be the super oily burnt thing, but some beans want to be roasted a little bit darker. But I think maybe there's some fear in that, some trepidation, because you want to separate yourself so much from the predecessors and what came before. But I think your quality speaks for itself. The, the coffee is so good. I'm willing to come back and pay four bucks when I don't know what the hell I'm drinking. And I know a lot of other people are willing to do that. So why not embrace these new terms or these terms, maybe terms that were being used to sell coffee in the past. Embrace maybe the roasts that were being used to sell coffee in the past, but do it with this new sensibility, the sensibility that you guys have all worked so hard to do. I think another thing that can be done as far as variety, I've been talking a lot about brewed coffee, but I think also in how the coffee is offered and how you're being open-minded to people putting maybe milk and sugar in their coffee. I know that's like a huge no-no and some, some shops don't even offer it. Some shops make you ask for it, which makes people feel uncomfortable as well. But this is actually, Angie's here. I didn't know she was gonna be here, but this is, a, this is her pop-up coffee shop at my local farmer's market. I'm lucky enough to live in Long Beach where a lot of my coffee shops and roasters are already kind of doing a lot of the things that I'm talking about, which made my research kind of null. I had to go outside of Long Beach in order to, to find out how, how truly baristas are interacting and educating. And so I loved this because it says old school. It says that this is the old school way. If you want to do it old school, which is cool, right? Old school is retro. Like everyone wants to be old school. Like that's fine. It doesn't stigmatize it. It doesn't make people feel like they're not cool. It just 
So it, and it invites conversation. If someone goes, well, that's old school, what's new school? And then you can say, oh, new school's like just the regular, just drink it black because they're good. And so, and I know that there's also, um, there are some roasts and some beans that if you put cream and sugar in them, they're going to taste horrible. You're going to completely mess it up and it'll burn. And, and I've actually messed up and done that in my early days of specialty coffee drinking. And so what if it said on, on, like on your board, when, you, when it says what you have on deck, you're like, oh, this is the one to drink if you put cream and sugar in your coffee. You know, destigmatize it a little bit and be open-minded to wherever people are in that journey of, of knowledge and of understanding. That's the only way that craft beer got to where it is today. And if somebody does insist on having half and half and, and, and sugar in their coffee, maybe you can let them do that and pu pull a pour a little off on the side and give them a little taster and say, hey, why don't you try it black just maybe for next time? There's a lot of natural sugars in it. It, it still tastes really sweet. Maybe you don't even need the cream. And I've, I've sat there, I've sat at Lord Windsor and watched as people have become converted at the end of their coffee, they've come back up and said, hey, thanks, man, for giving me that on the side. Like, I'll do it black next time. You're right. People just don't know because they feel intimidated by it. And so if you can create an open space, just like craft beer has done, and helped the consumer wherever they're at in their knowledge, not expecting them to know everything at once and not, not expecting that or not... Um, not stigmatizing them for having no knowledge, for starting at, at Blue Moon, let's say, uh, whatever, the uh, Folgers would be the coffee equivalent, I guess, right? And to be open-minded about that and to use terminology to come down to their level and help bring them up, I think you guys will be, have so much growth, just like the craft beer industry has. And so I think if we can continue to learn from one another, craft beer and specialty coffee will continue to live in harmony. Thank you.